Hey, good evening, good evening, and welcome to another episode of Trap No More podcast, sponsored by Trap Families, hosted by myself, Brother Jojo Godinez. Today's episode, we do have a great, mighty man of God. He hasn't always been that. He'll share that in just a few seconds. I wanted to thank you for being patient with us. We were having a little trouble with our Wi-Fi. It was all on me. I, I apologize. Please forgive me. But I pray that you've been having a blessed day. I pray that your week was good. Your weekend is finishing off strong. You're ready to go into this new week, filled, rested, and, and, and looking to great things to come. But tonight, though, I just want to remind you, so don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. So you don't miss out on nothing that Trap Families presents on this uh, YouTube channel. So tonight, I, I you know, I don't even want to, you know, waste any more time because I know some of you have been waiting for an hour. Is it like an hour already? Yes, 658. I apologize for reals, for real. Sorry. This will never happen again. I promise. Um, sorry. All right. So we're just go jumping right into it right now. So on this evening, like I said, we have a mighty man of God with us. His name is Vince, Evangelist Vince, Mighty Man Vince, all that good stuff, man. You've probably seen him around, you know, preaching fire. You might have been around when he was singing. This man is multi-gifted. I mean, he has, he has gifts to reach people that can't be reached. So tonight, I pray that you just have your hearts open. Um, if you need to use the restroom, just wait for about an hour until we uh jump into some phone calls but hold it man all right don't go nowhere stay by your by your computer stay on your phone whatever you're watching on stay posted you don't want to miss this uh go ahead and hit the share button do what you got to do but with no further ado welcome brother vince i appreciate you being here on this evening i know you come from about an hour away and Thank you on this oh, no. on this Sunday evening, man. Joe, I appreciate Joe, the pleasure, you. The pleasure is all mine, George. I appreciate the opportunity and the invite to come and be part of this tonight. Yes, well, thank you, brother. So, as we already mentioned during our hour delay, <laughs> so what I would like you to do is just take us back to the early years of Vince's life, and I uh, just want to put it out there. I already asked him to give us the raw version. So, if you have any children watching, I normally put right there that it's for you know, adult audiences just because of the content. Um, sometimes, you know, there's some violent things that are mentioned. There's drugs that are mentioned. There's incarceration, stabbings, and different things. So if you are watching, you know, young children just, I mean, I doubt that you, you I mean, I already know you ain't going to hear no profanity, no swearing, nothing crazy like that. You ain't going to hear no sex stories, nothing like that. But you may hear some details of some violence or whatnot, some abuse. So, just our little disclosure going forward. Is that is that safe to say? That's very safe to say. I, I, I am very raw and, and transparent. I say things that most ministers won't say because, you know, a lot of times people are too concerned about their reputation or their title or what people think. And um, I've kind of got beyond myself with that because I believe that God's given to me what he wants to give through me. And so that's why I, I just, I'm not too concerned about um, what people think about when they, when they hear my testimony, um, Jojo, I, I, you know, coming from the neighborhood, I have a testimony that that's similar to a lot of guys that come from the neighborhood, like yourself gone through the, you know, through the gang thing and through the drug thing. But, um, I also share things that most guys like say don't want to share because it's humiliating, and embarrassing. And, and, but I know that, um, I've, God's given it to me as a, as a, a tool to be able to, to minister to those people that, that are suppressing that pain. Yeah. And it helps. So you got the platform right now, brother Ben. Yeah. So go with it, man. Go back and tell us where you're from, where you grew up at. Yeah. Uh, what was your early years in the household, your relationship between mother, father, you know, who raised you, stuff like that. So, yeah. Well, I, I was born in 1962 in, in Watts, California, right there in the low income projects on 105th and Compton. And we lived there during the Watts riots, not the Rodney King riots, but the Watts riots in the sixties. Okay. And, um, I'm, I'm one of five children. I'm the second to the oldest. And all of us, all of, of my, my siblings and I, we're all from the same mom, but we're all from different dads. Each one of us are from different dads. 
And I, like I said, I was the second to the oldest. My mom, um, she, my mom was my mom was a prostitute, and I'm the results of one of her customers. Um, my last name, as you can see, it's Margolis. In reality, that's not even my real last name. I don't know what my real last name is. Um, my mom gave me my biological father's last name uh, because he um, agreed to. He, he doesn't have any biological children, or he hadn't had any then, um, and so I was his first blood son. And he told my mom that if she gave him gave me his last name that he would give her child support for me. He was a businessman. He owned a, a little carnesaria right there in the Colonia in Watts. And that's where my mom met him and, um, and ex exchanging sexual favors for money and things like that. That's where I came about. Um, and so like I said, living right there in the low income, low income projects. Um, my, again, my last name, my father was a Russian Jew. And so um, when they migrated from Russia over to the United States, my grandfather, he told me the story when I got, I finally met my biological father when I was about five years old, but he told me um, that uh, the guy in front of him, when they were coming across into, into the United States, the guy in front of him used that name, Margos, they let him in. So my grandfather used the name, they let him in. He said, that's why they kept the name. Mm. But I don't really know what my last name is. But getting past that, um, I just wanted to clarify that because people ask me all the time, is your last name Italian? Is it Greek? I mean, it's sure not Mexican. But um, I, I guess I, um, because I've been raised in that, in the Hispanic neighborhood or in that culture, I've embraced that. Um, and uh, so, but there again, in being, my mom being a prostitute, my mom was the kind of prostitute that didn't take her customers to a hotel. Um, she worked the, the, the neighborhood, she worked the projects, and she brought her customers home with her. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, you know, I was in that kind of a setting, a dysfunctional, toxic setting in our home. And, um, you know, and when I went through my adolescence, I got involved in gangs. I was part of the tourist gang from Compton and uh, was being mentored by an older cousin. And um, from the t being that my father was a Russian Jew, I've been this big since I was 13 years old because all the men in his family were large statued men. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and because of the, the hell that I went through as a child, it caused me to become very, inner, I, I just suppressed and, I, I became an introvert. I became very just. I, I just, just put everything inside me. I didn't really didn't didn't talk much. Didn't 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 express myself. Uh, I, I had some social skills that weren't very, you know, weren't very good because I was just constantly um, expressing myself in violence because of the hell that I went through as a child. I can say my, my mother being a prostitute, bringing her customers home from the time I was three years old, JoJo Tal, I was probably almost almost I was almost ten years old. I was molested by my mom's customers mm. because she brought them home with her and being to the second to the oldest, it was at, at, the, at the time when my mom was prostituting, it was just myself, my older brother. And then I had a, a little sister um, and then my, my second sister didn't come till later on. Um, but um, for whatever reason, um, you know, um, and when I say I was molested, I'm not talking about just fondled. Mm -hmm. I was sodomized. I was f raped constantly and I was forced to do things that no one should ever do. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't want to really get into the detail of all that, but if you can imagine it, that's what was happening. Mm. You know, and, um, and it was happening on a, on a consistent basis. And I, I, you know, when you're that young and those kinds of things are being pressed into your, into your, your, your psyche, into your, your, your development. Um, and to me, it, it almost became to the point where I thought this was happening in every household. It was happening to every little boy. And, um, and so I just, it, it twisted my mentality. It affected my sexuality. Uh, and not that I ever, you know, got off into, you know, going, you know, becoming homosexual or anything like that, but it just, it, it, it tampered with me mentally. And, um, my mom, uh, she finally married my baby brother's dad, which came 13 years after the fact. Um, and, uh, this man, he didn't, uh, he didn't sexually abuse me. He would physically abuse me. He would, he would beat me unconscious every time that he would discipline me. His, his disciplining skills were just twisted and extreme. And I think he was angry because he was raising other people's kids. Mm. And so he would take it out on me. And so going through that kind of abuse, I mean, if you can kind of think of somebody from the age of three to nine, 10 years old um, being treated that way, after a while, I just kind of thought this is normal and this is what happens. And uh, because the way I was being treated and the things that I was forced to do, um, like I said, it, it messed with me psychologically to the point where I didn't think I was human. I felt like I was yeah. an object. And so it was really challenging for me. Yeah. Hey, Vince, let me ask you something before we go further. And I don't mean to, you know, interrupt your conversation, but when this new father, your, your, 
your little brother's father came into the picture. I'm assuming, was there a time period where he was a good father, like trying to win over your mom and you before he became abusive? Or was it right from the gate he just stepped in and started abusing you? The reason why I'm asking is because I'm thinking after all that abuse from your mother's customers leading up to when you were about 10, you said? Mm -hmm. And then finally another man comes in and your mom's pregnant with this guy. And was there ever a sense like, dang, finally I got a real man in my life? Or what was your thoughts? I mean, because I'm assuming you weren't thinking... I don't know. I, you know what? I don't even want to assume, but what was what was going through your psyche at that time with a new man coming in, your mom's pregnant, he's sticking around. What were you thinking? You, you, you say that, Jojo, and it, 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 to be honest with you, yeah, when he first came into the household and then um, I, I seen him, you know, he took us out of where we were living at and got us into a, a, an apartment and um, he, he moved us around a lot at first. I mean, we went from living... Uh, he met my mom in Highland Park and went from Highland Park to Glendale, from Glendale to Burbank, from Burbank to the San Fernando Valley. And but there was a, a sense of stability because at first, um, maybe the first year or so, I remember him taking me and dropping me off at school. I never had that. A father take me to school and okay. drop me off. He did that. I remember him doing that a couple of times, but it didn't take very much longer. Matter of fact, the first time that I, I don't know, I did something wrong. He sent me to the room. And he told me, you're going to get it. That was the, this was the first time that he physically abused me. I thought he was sending me to the room and I thought it was coming. The sexual abuse was coming. Mm. And so the first time I went in the room, I did because I thought it was coming. I went in the room and I took off all my clothes. I just, I just, I was already in my program thinking because that's what the other men did to me. Mm -hmm. And so when he walked in the room and I had no clothes on, he looked at me and he goes, what is wrong with you? Put your clothes on, you know? And he walked out of the room and I can hear him. He's talking to my mom in the other room. And uh, then he came back in and then he started, started whipping on me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, it, it confused me. Um, and then it, it, every time, I mean, he would whip me to the point I would pass out. I just, the pain was so excruciating. He would hit me with a bout. He would hit me with a board. He would hit me with his fist. Um, he kicked me a few times. Um, and so, but it would, he would beat me to the point where I would pass out wow. just because the pain was just, uh, and, you know, and I look and, at my other siblings and I don't ever remember them. I mean, I, I remember him spanking my little sisters a couple of times, but it was, it seemed when he spanked then it was just a, a, you know, a pat on the butt and he was whipping him like that. But with me, he was releasing some anger. I could feel it mm. in his discipline. I mean, he was hollering at me and cussing at me. The one time he bit me on my forearm because I wouldn't let go of something he was trying to get out of my hand and to get me to let go of it, he bit me to get, to, to make, get me to release it. Oh, wow. And so I, I you know, at, it was weird. Cause like I said, you, you'd be surprised how, um, things will mess with you mentally where I came to the point where I thought to myself, I was trying to process this as a young, a young kid. I was trying to process the abuse. And um, I thought at one point I said, this man doesn't get off on sexually abusing me. It was different. I thought he got off on watching me cry. Mm. And so I remember when I turned, I, I was just, I, I was 10 years old for a few months. And when I started processing this in my young mind, I said to myself, I'm not going to give him that satisfaction anymore. I'm not going to cry. Mm. And he would beat me and I would, because before I would cry, it hurt, obviously. And I would, I, I would lock up in my emotions and I can remember, I, even as I tell you this, I can still remember that, that those moments where I'm trying not to cry and I would shake and then I would pass out. Mm -hmm. And from the time that, that I locked, I shut down that emotion of crying from that point until the day when I received Christ into my heart, I did not cry. And I mm -hmm. went through a lot of trauma in those nine years. I went through a lot of pain, a loss of friends, of uh, physical pain, sickness. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I remember when I gave my life to the Lord, it's like he turned on the waterworks. Amen. And I remember, but in, in that, in that time growing up and along with the, all the sexual abuse that I went through, the physical abuse, um, my older brother, because we look completely different, he's, he's dark skin or was, he went to be with the Lord already, but um, he and I were arch enemies. We were from different varios in the neighborhood. Oh, wow. He was from a varios from, from, from Watts. I was like I said, I was from a varro from Compton. And um, if at, at home, we had neutral ground. We wouldn't fight in front of my mom. Um, and, uh, and, but on there, there was one time when we got into it, I, I wanted to kill him. Had my cousins not been there, I would have killed him. And so it was, it was pretty challenging. It, it, matter of fact, prior to us going through our adolescence, getting involved in gangs, he, he drowned me to death. He held me underwater oh, wow. and killed me. Hey, Brother Vince, so let me ask you, during all them years of abuse, was there any ever anyone that tried to come to your rescue? Was there any 
other family members or anybody that got a glimpse of what was going on to my, young my aunt, aunt, my mom's little sister. She wanted to take me and adopt me, her mm-hmm. and her husband, because she seen. I don't know if she if she was uh, uh, realizing that there was sexual abuse going on, but she could see the emotional abuse that I was going through because I would cry all the time. Mm-hmm. As a little boy, I would cry. And I remember her taking me and she told my mom, you know, let us adopt him. Mm-hmm. Me and my husband want to adopt him because my mom would just let me cry. She wouldn't pick me up. She would never. I, I tell my wife all the time, I can't remember my mom hugging me and telling me she loved me. But I always used to watch her give attention to my older brother. But she didn't want to give you up, though. But she, but because she got child support. Oh. That was her lunch ticket. Mm-hmm. And, and and because she gave my, my, my biological father, she gave me his last name. That was that was her mad money. Yeah, you know it was free money for her. She didn't spend it on me, um, and so my aunt wanted to to adopt me. But she and to this day, my aunt, I I would call my aunt my mom. She's my mom mm-hmm. because she, even though, um, you know, because at, at when I turned thirteen years old, I took my last beating from my stepdad, mm-hmm. and I was already contemplating in my mind, I'm going to kill this man. Wow. And I so and my mom wasn't going to leave him. Yeah. And so I just I said to myself, I, I took I remember he. He he beat me real bad, and um, I, I had to I had to sleep on my stomach for 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 a few weeks because of the beating that he gave me, and then I just I told my mom I'm not taking another beating, I'll I'll, I'll kill him if he touches me again, and so I told her I'm, I'm leaving. And so at thir- at 13 years old I got all my stuff, because I was I've been this big, um, I always hung around with older guys, and I had a homeboy that lived right around the corner from me, and he told me he goes you can come and live with me, bro, and so I moved in with him and. Uh, he was a young married couple, him and his wife, and he had an extra room, and and I left and never went back, and I've been on my own ever since. But uh, but I got involved in gangs, got involved in in drugs, you know, at an early age. I I started, um, I was trying to numb out, yeah. and um, I remember when I got into my first fight, um, it 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 was a release of pain. I wasn't just inflicting pain, but it was releasing pain. Oh, I can't even imagine the victim of that fight. Oh, it was, uh, you know, it it. it I don't even like to think about it because I just I I just remember and I and also in Jojo I realized that doing that it became my coping mechanism. I I realized I can de- I can I can defend myself and they can't hurt me no more. Yeah. Or if they do hurt me, they're going to they're going to get hurt too. Yeah. I can defend myself, and so I started. That became my coping mechanism. Every time um, I felt threatened, I would explode. I got to the point where my homeboys didn't want me going with them anywhere because I keep, I didn't keep, keep my mouth shut. Up, yeah. yeah, I would go off. No, Every time relate. we go out to go party, I'd go off. It didn't take much. Somebody just looked at me sideways. And not because I was some big bad. I got beat up a lot because I just couldn't keep my mouth shut because yeah. I just, but the more I, even when I would get beat up, it, it was a sense of a feeling of satisfaction because the pain that I was receiving, I was afflicting. Yeah. And it was releasing a lot of the hurt that was inside of me. Yeah. And it was an ugly way to live, man. I, I, I you know, and like I said, at, at, but when I gave my life to the Lord at 19 years old, I wasn't in church. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for God. He came looking for me with a bench warrant. <laughs> yeah, tell us about that, man. You know, my my salvation experience. I wasn't, I wasn't when I finally came. That that those, I, I, I back before I got saved. Like I said I got involved in gangs and I started. I became a heroin addict. Um, uh, was taking all kinds of pills. Um, I was doing coke and I became an alcoholic. You know, all the stuff that you get involved with in the neighborhood. Because Anything was, that could numb. Exactly. I was just trying to numb out. And I always hung around with older guys. I just didn't relate to the younger So ones. it was easy to get all that stuff. Yeah, it was, it was and right they would there. use me. My, my, my older cousin, he, he's already gone. He's in eternity. And uh, he was, I was, he went through the prison system. His last term he did in San Quentin. And when he came out, he was affiliated. And he was, he was, mentoring me i became his protege and he was mentoring me for that lifestyle and because i was young he used to always tell me if you get caught he goes you'll get out real quick because you're young and so he would they would give him orders and he would hand them to me and 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 school me through it at a very very early age and so i started getting involved with that and um and in my mind in my twisted way of thinking uh there was satisfaction in it because of the, the the things that he was having me do and um and, and I, I could imagine that you had a sense of purpose where you felt belonged. You felt like, you know, with all that pain in me, shoot, you know, this is this is something that I was made for, you exactly. know, to inflict pain and destruction because that's what was given to you. Yep. Pain, destruction, chaos, you know, as a young boy, 
and you finally get the opportunity to inflict it upon others, what had been inflicted on you yeah. when you couldn't defend yourself. Yeah, that was just, you know, a releasing your dopamines. All of that stuff was being satisfied in, in that process. So let me ask you something. Um, what was your schooling like during all them years? I could imagine a lot of difficulty, you know, trying to focus with all that going on. Oh, yeah. I, you know, when I dropped out of school in the 11th grade and I went to my counselor, and I was going to back then they had, you could do what was called an efficiency test. And it helped you to get, you couldn't get, a, obviously couldn't get a, a diploma with an efficiency test, but you could at least get a GED. And so I did this efficiency test and my counselor came back with the, with the outcome of it. And he looked at me, he goes, he goes, you're setting yourself up for failure. He goes, you're illiterate. He goes, you have no comprehension of what you're reading. You, you can't spell to save your life, literally to save your life. He goes, you can't even spell that, man. And I, I got, I guess I got it in my mind, you know, I'm going to be a laborer all my life. It don't make any difference. I don't need no education. I got street wise and, you know, street educa education. And, but, you know, it, even through all my madness, Jojo, I've always had a sense of, of purpose in life. And I knew that there was something that was on my, a hand that was on my life because I should have died through all the abuse. Because when I tell you I've been abused, it, I can't, it doesn't scratch the surface of the abuse that I've been through. Things yeah, I can't even imagine. I, I was sharing with my wife just a couple of months ago, some things that came back to my mind when I told her, she goes, you never told me that. I go, because I've suppressed that and certain things just triggers those, those memories. And I shared that with her, man, when I did, to this day, you know, here I've been walking with the Lord for July will be 42 years. But to wow. this day, I still wake up sometimes two or three times a week with, with nightmares. And that's how PTSD. Yeah. Screaming. Uh, crying, shaking, sweating profusely, and it—I mean, it scares the the lights, the daylights out of her. I mean, she feels like she's sleeping next to her. You know what? Sometimes. I, you know what? I, I'm glad you're sharing that, brother. I'm I'm really glad that you're sharing that. And for any Christians that have been saved multiple years, and and because I have a lot of, you know, I'm connected to a lot of Christians that have been saved for a while, and they suffered, you know, similar things. You know, just a lot of trauma in their youth, and they kind of question their walk in Christ because they still have these nightmares and they feel like, why hasn't the Lord delivered me? You know, why do I still suffer from these nightmares and whatnot, you know? And, and I told them, you know, I, I can't answer that completely, but I do know that Christ has set us free. Mm -hmm. God has delivered us from, you know, the curse of the law. God has delivered us from, you know, the trap of Satan and all that. I thought I said, but, you know, I can't answer why we still suffer because I'm similar, you know, I've been saved, you know, 30, a little bit over 32 years now. And I still have stuff that wakes me up in the middle of the night. I wake up all sweaty. I wake up not wanting to turn on the light because I think there's blood on my hands, you know, so I turn on the light with my yeah, elbow. Yep. And then when I turn on the lights and I'm looking, I'm like, what the heck is going on with me? You know, I wake up, my legs are tired because I was running or fighting in my sleep. And you know, of course, I just go back in a prayer and ask the Lord, like, Lord, just, you know, comfort my heart right now because it's heavy, you know, because mm -hmm. every time we relive that stuff, we feel that that burden as if it was that real yeah. once again, you know. Yeah. So just for you that are watching, you know, that been saved and you battle with that, just know that you're not alone. You know, it's not a reason to question your salvation. You know, it's just a matter of us being able to cope with it and know where we stand today in the Lord. Right. Yeah, I, have. I know. I mean, because I've, like you say, I've prayed many times, God, I, I'm i tired of preaching out of my pain. I'm tired of ministering out of my pain. I want to minister out of my healing. Mm -hmm. And just talking about it it, 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 it stirs up all those emotions. But I thank God that I have those emotions because there was time, like I said, I was hard. I wouldn't cry. And it, you, when God turned on the waterworks, man, I can watch Disney movies and cry now. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I'm but, the same way. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that either. No. You know, when something hits, it hits, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Where I feel for people, you know? Yeah. And at one time I was like, you know, just very callous and, you know, non-remorseful about anything, you know? Yeah. My I whole thing used to be you. like better them than me, you know? And I'll see somebody debtors better them than me, you know, and keep yeah. on pushing. Yeah. That stuff wouldn't fade me. I'm like, shoot, you know, things yeah. happen. Yeah. That used to be my, that used to be my, you know, my reality, but now when I see somebody hurt or whatever, you know, it really hits home and I feel pain. And I, you know, I thank the Lord for giving us that soft heart yeah, per se, you know? Yeah. 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 And I've so, asked God, like I said, I've asked God many times, Lord, he, I, I don't, I'm tired of ministering out of, out of my pain, you know? 
And the Lord keeps, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to carry, keep carrying this burden around, you know, this feeling around. I don't want to keep putting my wife through my, my coping mechanisms of, of getting angry and, and trying to deal with life. And I think, you know, the Bible says that, that, that we're no longer, you know, conformed to this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. And I'm constantly trying to get my mind right and my mind, you know, renewed and not thinking and coping like the way I used to dealing with situations and circumstances. And I thank God that God's given me, and, and, I, and I say it with the utmost of humility, God's given me humility and has taken away my pride Amen. and has stripped me of that. And so before, like I said, I didn't, I, when I first got saved, I, I heard some guys, you know, when you first get saved, you hear some of these testimonies of gang members and, and drug addicts, and it's the same, it almost sounds the same all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and so I started testimony, testifying like that. But one day I was at Chino Prison ministering and right there. We were walking the tears and ministering, and then we had a chapel service. And at the chapel service was the first time, and I was with, with Chaplain Bob Mercado, and he, before I got up, Bob goes, Vince, just be real. And at first, I didn't know what he meant by that. As I was sitting there, and I was, I was gathering my thoughts and what I was going to share, the Lord told me, and this is the way the Lord, I didn't hear an audible voice, but this is the way he spoke it into my heart. He goes, Vince, take away your spiritual fig leaf and just be real with these people. There's somebody that's sitting here today that needs to hear this, your story. And I remember I got up there and I just began, and if any place, you know, talk about being molested. Oh, yeah. From prison, you know, I, I, I didn't want to look lame. I didn't want to throw up red flags, if, but, you know, but like that. But I just said, you know what? I'm not going to really, I'm not concerned about what people think. I don't care what these guys think about me. You know, a hero, a next homeboy, you know, drug addict, dope fiend, you know, a gang member. You know, you don't say stuff like that. And so when I got up and I started sharing it, that was just this guy sitting in the back of the chapel, this older white guy. And as I was sharing, I watched him all of a sudden begin to break down and cry as I'm in, as I'm sharing my testimony. And he was un, unconsolable. You couldn't you couldn't say something. I couldn't help him from where I was sitting at. And there, when you minister in the chapel, chapel you really can't do an altar call where we they can come down. We can yeah, answer. Yeah. As he was walking past, he came walking and he stopped. And, and and the seal was watching him. And he shook my hand and he was still crying. And he tells me he says, Pastor Vince, he goes, I want you to know. He goes, today when you were sharing your story, you were sharing my story. He goes, I've been state raised. He goes, I've been coming to this chapel for the last four or five years. He goes, and he goes, I've never responded to an invitation to receive Christ into my life. He goes, but it, 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 he goes, as you were sharing your story, he goes, if God's done what he's done in your life, and you can make it and you can keep it, keep living your life and you can be productive and, 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 and do it what you're doing. He goes, it gave me hope. He goes, today, he goes, I invited Christ to come into my heart today. Amen. I dropped my guard. Amen. And when I left that night, the Lord showed me, he goes, you know, what you've been through isn't just for you. It's for other people that need Amen. to hear what you've been through. Because if you can make it, they can make it. Amen. And I'm for whoever out there is listening to you tonight, you know, I want you to know, no matter what you've been through, you know, I read the story in the Bible about Joseph. You know, I know what it's like to feel rejected from your siblings. Me and my, like I say, me and my brother were arch enemies. He, he, he drowned me to death. I know what it's like to not feel the love of your parents. Like I say, my mom never hugged me, never told me. And that's not a boohoo story. This is a reality. That, you know, when you're brought up in, in that that lifestyle, when you're brought up in the dysfunctional, you know, my mom was raped by her mom, I mean, by her dad and her brother, and she was just repeating the cycle and not even realizing it. She didn't know how to be a mom. You know, she went through her own hell, but it, it put me in harm's way, and so it put me through the hell. But if you're out there listening, I want you to know that, you know what, you know, what the devil purposes for evil, God's used my story now because I'm transparent about it. I've had so many guys come up to me and tell me, you know what, Vince? What you've been through, I've been through that. I haven't even, I have never even told my wife that I've been through this. But man, he goes to hear, I've had guys tell me to hear your transparency and your honesty about how God can help you through life. I thank God he's blessed me with a, a loving wife that, that she, she feels my pain and she knows that, you know what, there's, there's hope for me yeah. and that love covers a multitude of sins. Yes. That if she'll just keep loving me and keep Amen. praying for me, but man, it, it's a cross to carry, yes. you know, and, and I'm not saying that it, it's easy. Yeah, but God's grace is sufficient. Amen, amen. That's that's deep, bro. If you don't mind me asking, brother Vince, what's your relationship like right now with your mother? My mom's gone to be with the Lord, you know, and and she was up in in Atlanta, Georgia, with my little sister. But my, we had a strained relationship for for many many years, many years, because after you know after my my biological father, she had an affair with him all the way until until he died, and after he passed away, um, she she made an effort to surrender to the Lord, but she was still messed up in her, in her thinking and very opinionated, had an attitude of entitlement. And she just was just, she was just a, a, just a hard person to deal with. 
And so I just kind of, I, I separated myself from her, mm. but I never really made men's with her Yeah. until, um, she became demented and she was already in a, like a convalescent home in the, into, in the, in the, there's a, uh, a, a place there for people that are with dementia and stuff. And the Lord dealt with me. And he says, before I take her home, I want you to make it right with her. And so I flew out to Atlanta, Georgia. And when I got to go see her, um, she would come in and out of that, of that demented state of mind. Mm -hmm. And when I first walked, came up to her, she didn't know who I was. My mom was a, she, every time she seen a man, she was very flirtatious. And so when she seen me, they had her sitting in a wheelchair out in the hallway. And as I'm walking towards her, she's already smiling at me, kind of flirting with me. And, but I had her little sister with her, with me, the one that I call mom. And so she recognized her, but she didn't recognize me. And so my aunt goes, you know who this is? And she referred to me as Armando. She goes, no, it's not Armando, it's your son, Vincent. And so she's looking at me and then she recognized me. Mm. But in that visit, we were sitting in her room and I was having a conversation with her and she came into this margin of time where reality was there. And I could tell by our conversation. And I just told her, I says, mom, I, I, wanna, I wanna ask you something. Have you ever received Christ into your heart? And she got real indignant. She goes, have you? <laughs> I go, yeah, mom, I have. And she goes, well, so have I. Mm -hmm. I go, okay, that's good, mom. I go, and I want to tell you something. I want, I want to ask you if you'd please forgive me. Yeah. And she goes, for what? I go, it doesn't matter. I go, I've just harbored some things in my heart towards you, and I just want forgiveness, and I want you to know I forgive you. And she goes, well, what did I do to you? I go, it doesn't make any difference. It really doesn't. I just want you to know I forgive you, and I want you to forgive me. And she just kind of, okay, whatever, you know. Yeah. But it gave me a release. It gave me a film. But we never, we never really had a mother son relationship. Like I said, she never, never embraced me. Never showed me affection. And as far as my father was concerned, the same thing. I, I met him when I was five. I seen him about once a year, and then my mom destroyed that relationship mm. between me and him. But uh, and then I, my older brother, like I said, we were arch enemies. The last six months of his life here on Earth, uh, he was diagnosed with uh, cancer liver because he had cirrhosis. And he reached out to me. I really didn't like talking to him because he was just stuck on the past. Mm -hmm. All he talked about was the past. He would repeat the stories over and over again. So I didn't like really conversating with him. Mm -hmm. But he gave his life to the Lord. And I knew that he had a genuine born-again experience because when he called me, our conversations were completely different. Mm -hmm. And it was actually enjoyable talking with him. He called me every morning. Uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning, he would call me, and we'd have conversations. And matter of fact, when he stepped over from this life into eternity, I was holding his hand and uh, uh, to watch him leave, man. It was, it was a pr pretty amazing experience that I knew where he was going. He yeah. had given his life to the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Man, that's deep right there. Yeah. It's really deep. So when you were 19 and you, you know, had your moment of clarity your your salvation, you said it wasn't in the church. Um, what, what did that look like your early years of coming to Christ? You know, with all that pain, you know, I mean, because I know when we get delivered, I mean, when we ask the Lord into our lives, I know the Holy Spirit comes and he starts a process. But sometimes it takes it takes another process to get delivered from all of that craziness, you know, uh, trusting people, you know, even trusting a person that we may call our pastor, you know, <laughs> trusting these brothers that want to want a part of our lives. And it's like we learn to live on our own. We ain't letting nobody in. But what did that look like for you? You know, you said two things, process and trust. It was a process. The first six months of my salvation, Jojo, I, I was still slamming. I'd come, to, I'd come to church just smack back, bro, nodding. But my pastor, he, he was totally oblivious to street people. He's a, a, a white man from Oklahoma. Oh, okay. And, but he came to a, a little church in the city of Maywood <laughs> back in the 80s. And... He didn't know what a vato loco was. He thought a vato loco was like a pollo loco. He, <laughs> he, he didn't know what it was, bro. And uh, and I remember coming that I got invited to the church, and uh, and I actually lived in Maywood at the time, and so it was convenient. I went into the church, but I walked into the church. It was kind of a, it was weird because here here's this white guy in a green polyester suit and cowboy boots. But I looked around the congregation, and it's a Nothing bunch of homes. chicums. <laughs> And I recognized them. They were guys from rival barrios from where I was from. Yeah, yeah. And I thought to myself, man, this is a trip. Either God's real in this place or there's going to be a fight right after service. Yeah, there's something up right yeah, here. Yeah, something's going down. You know, I was like, maybe they're going to pass the Kool-Aid after the service. I don't know what <laughs> it was going on. But I remember what coming in there and I say process. Because he was not streetwise. And yeah. I would come into service 
I'm talking smack back. I'd be nodding in service. And I remember he, he, after I guess guys started to explain to him what was going on because he came up to me and he put his arm around me and I was, I was still using, and he told me, he goes, Vince, I don't know what you're going through, man, but whatever it is, just keep coming, man. God's going to work in your life. Amen. God's going to call in your life. Instead and, of and kicking you out, he's uh, still embracing you. He embraced me. And he told me afterwards, he goes, you know, he goes, when I used to see you, you know, nodding, he goes, I thought, I thought man, this guy is committed. He comes to church tired and he still comes to church. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the time we had a guy that was coming to church. He was a diamond bar sheriff. Okay. And um, he was one of the few white guys in the church. He wasn't even white. He was actually Puerto Rican, but he looks like a, he looked like a white guy. He was married to a white lady. Mm -hmm. um, and he came to church and because I, 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 I didn't trust, I had trust issues. Mm -hmm. um, I came in church and seen all these homeboys from different neighborhoods, guys that are from all over the place. I came strapped. I had a 38 strap to my ankle. And I remember I'd hit the altar and that cop, the dime bar cop said, he used to see the gun strapped to my ankle and he never said nothing to me about it. And he watched me, mm -hmm. but he never sent to me about it and right around the corner from where the church was at there used to be a, a little dairy on the corner and sometimes right after prayer meeting before service would start we'd walk over there and i remember i just i dropped my guard i got i really surrendered to the lord and i finally i stopped using and god delivered me i didn't have one of those sovereign deliverances where i didn't have any any you know Great. ideas afterwards i i went through that whole gamut i believe i had to mm -hmm. there was a purpose for it because if god would have just sovereignly delivered me i wouldn't have appreciated it yeah but i had to fight for it I had to earn it, to own it, Amen. and God helped me through that. He gave me the grace to, to, to get through that. But I remember walking to the dairy, and, and that, that one cop, he comes up, and he puts his arm around me. He goes, hey, Vince, he goes, it's so good to see you're not wearing your gun anymore. <laughs> Man. I That's said, you knew cool. I was wearing a gun? He goes, I, every time you went to the altar, I seen it hanging out of the bottom of your pants, man. Mm. But the trust issues, I just didn't trust anybody. But I did, to be honest with you, Jojo, I didn't even trust God. Yeah. I didn't trust God. I wouldn't trust God with my pain. I couldn't trust God with my hurts, with my fears, because I didn't know what it was like to have a father. Every man yeah. in my, every, every male figure in my life either sexually abused me, physically abused me, abandoned me, hurt me, you know, ripped me off, um, didn't show me any kind of love. And so when somebody told me that God loved me, mm -hmm. I didn't believe it, bro. Especially when they use the term like your heavenly father, you know, or you know father god or whatever whenever that term i could imagine you know that that wasn't something that clicked good with you no like you were saying you know maybe not just the male figure in general but just that term father yeah because of them father figures in your life you know abusing you you know in multiple ways you yeah. know and i felt like if 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 he really loved me then why did he allow me to go to the hell through mm. I got, and I used to have those conversations with God. I didn't know how to pray. So I just, somebody told me, talk to him like you would talk to somebody. And I talk, I, I would have conversations with God and I'd ask him the all heart. the time, why did, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why did you let me go through the abuse that I've been through? Why didn't you love me enough to save me from that? Yeah. And, and I never got an answer, but I would, I would, I would, sometimes I would holler at God. I yeah. would tell him, are you not yet entertained with the hell that I'm going through? And, you know, and so it, it, my, my first marriage, my, my first wife never got to this day. She's still not saved. I never, and she, through my first, it, it was like opposite. You usually see women go to church with their kids. It, it was opposite. It was me going to church with my kids. And my wife was never in the, my ex-wife was never in the picture. Mm -hmm. And so it even made it that much more challenging because I was praying for her salvation and it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you God, you don't hear my prayers. You know, you didn't deliver me sovereignly from my drug addiction. You're not taking away my nightmares and my pain. And, but for whatever reason, man, God just held a hold of me. God, God took my hand and he walked me through that valley. And as I matured and as I developed, the process was taking place. Mm -hmm. And the old way of thinking was, 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 was the new way of thinking was starting to happen. Yeah. And when I realized that I felt God pulling on my heart, when I realized there was a call and everything that I went through was for a purpose, Amen. it was part of my resume and it was what God was going to use. And when I read the different stories about the different people in the Bible that had went through similar situations, when I think about Joseph, when I think about Job, when I think about David, you know, all these different characters in the Bible that, that had went through hardships and challenges. And, you know, and God, that, and when the people start telling me stuff like God will use the foolishness of this world. I, when I got saved, completely and totally illiterate, bro. I could not read. Mm -hmm. I could not read. And I got put in, a, in a, an embarrassing position 
to expose that that I couldn't read. We were in a Bible study and we're going around the room reading yeah. scriptures. And when it got to my turn, by the time it was coming, getting close to me, I was already sweating profusely, bro. I'm talking, I was sweating bullets. And I had, fortunately, the, the scripture that I had was maybe just three sentences, but I couldn't even get through those three sentences. And the brother sitting next to me was helping me out. Every other word he yeah. was helping me out. And afterwards, the, the the Bible study leader was gracious enough to come up to me and tell me, he goes, hey, bro, you can't read, huh? And I said, no, nah, I can't, man. And it, it was humiliating. But um, he gave me a children's Bible with pictures in it. And he gave me the Bible on cassette. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know what a cassette is, it was right <laughs> after the eight tracks. <laughs> And he gave it to me on cassette, but he messed me all up, Jojo. He gave it to me in the King James Version. <laughs> and so I'm listening to it, man. man these vatos talk even crazier than Chicanos, man. They, the way that they bow the and, and the and the yeah. yeast and the yeah, blood. That yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, had, I had to listen to the Bible and look at the pictures. And and then I always, when I went to church, I, I because I was by myself, I would sit in the front row because I didn't want to be distracted. And I would just listen and I would hear words. People tell me now that I talk like I'm educated. They always ask me what college I went to and what classes that I take. Yeah. But I've been in church, like I said, for 42 years, and I've gleaned from very wise men and listened to words that they use, and I realized that there's power in words, and, and I've learned those words. And thank God there's talking, so I don't have to type things anymore. Yeah. And uh, But it just, you know, that's an, another testimony to the fact that people say that God can't use you. If God can take somebody that was completely illiterate, mm -hmm. God took somebody that, that had no no education, and put me in a position where I can get up on a platform and he put a gift to be able to communicate. God can use anybody. It's not Amen. about your ability. It's just about your availability, making yeah. yourself available to God. I mean, I made myself available to the devil and he used me yeah. big time. So, you know, it's just, we go through life and it's a journey, it's a process. Amen. And we've got to just look at it through the lens of God, through faith. Yeah. That he can, I mean, look at you. Look where God's brought you from, Jojo. Mm -hmm. you got your own business, doing this podcast. Yes. Counseling with guys that are that, that that need some hope and need you know some direction for their life, and you know I don't know about you, but it just I guess God puts us uh, through these things in life because I, I I I don't know about you, I, I still deal with this lower nature. When people walk up and tell me I know what you've gone through and they never been through what I've gone through, mm -hmm. I want to slap them. Mm -hmm. Pray for me, bro. No, no, I I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, but because yeah. we've been through it and we can share from the heart from experience, I know what you're going through because I've been through. I walked that mile with you, man. It, it, it has validity. Yeah. It has it has some foundation because people will listen to that. And I believe that's why God's taken and chosen guys like us that'll be transparent. Yeah. They'll be willing to take the time and tell some, you know what? God changed me, he can change you. Yeah. He's yeah. not a limited God. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Amen. Amen. So praise God. So so yeah, so you're in that early church, Maywood. You start to be discipled by some great men. You start to, you know, get some positions in the church, start to get more and more in ministry. Tell us a little bit about, you know, from that time as the Lord started using you traveling the world, because I know you've traveled and, I mean, you've been all over the place. Yeah, I, well, I, I pioneered a church in the city of Azusa. I pioneered it from my house on a Bible study. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I always, I felt the call of God, but I didn't know exactly what it was. And I felt like I got pushed in the pool. I, I, I said, I wasn't looking to be a pastor. I just happened to mention to my pastor, um, you know, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And uh, so she just, at, at the time it was, uh, you know, uh, no one was rising up to take the call. And by me just mentioning to her, she says, well, I've always recognized the call of God in your life. And they, they sent me out to go pioneer church in the city of Azusa. I was living there already, started it in my house in a Bible study. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. It was all God, bro. I'm not an yeah. eloquent speaker. I'm kind of raw jaw. I'm a jailhouse preacher. Um, I've I've been in prison ministry for for about 18 years with Chaplain Bob. Did that when he we were we were going all over the place ministry in different prisons, mm -hmm. and um, and so I realized that I I enjoyed ministering in prisons mm -hmm. and from that setting because I way that I do minister I'm unorthodox. I say things that most pastors won't say from the platform. Like like Chaplain Bob. <laughs> like Cha yeah, he's my mentor. That's my papa, and so he always tells me just keep it real, Vince. The message Amen. hasn't changed. Just keep it real. Amen. You know, that's how we understand it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we relate to it. Yeah. You know? Hey, so speaking of, you know, prison and, you know, all your gangs and, and all that involvement, did you ever pick up any prison terms? No. I, I probably, I'm assuming probably some county time. I've done county time, but I've never done, I never went into any of the penitentiaries. I think God, 
I think God orchestrated that because I think if I had ever ended up in, in a penitentiary, I would have never came out mm -hmm. just because of my mentality. You know, but my, my cousins, they gave me my nickname and it wasn't because, um, it was because of my mentality. I was very, like I said, I was just violent and I did it like you talked about with no conscience. I, just, I had no, no remorse, no conscience. I was cold blooded because of all the, the callousness that I, that, that had happened to me because of all the hurt. And so when my, 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 one of my cousins, uh, there, there was four brothers that I hung around with mm -hmm. and they, um, they nicknamed me Capone because of, not because of the way, not, not just because the way that I dress, but because of my mentality. I would be, if I, if, my thing was, and I live by that model. I'm pretty, you know, I'm nice to everybody, but if you cross me, nice will be the last thing you'll ever remember about me mm -hmm. because I could be an animal. And not that I'm some tough, bad guy. Like I said, I got beat up a lot because I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I never thought through the, the consequences. Yeah. And so, um, but I, fortunately, I think God knew that if I had got, a, got caught up in the system, I would have never probably ever came out mm -hmm. because I'm, I, I'm very, like I said, being an introvert, I'm very comfortable in isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So bring us up to date. Like, what are you, what are you doing today? Like what's, what's your ministry now? I've been an evangelist for several years almost a couple of decades now, but, um, God's just, when I, when I gave up the church in, in the city of Azusa, I knew that that God, God wanted me to pioneer and pastor. So I would have the experience of what it felt like to pastor, um, you know, so that I could understand what the pastors go through as far as the blessings, the challenges, the hardships. So, cause again, I'm, I'm one of those kind of people, I know, I don't like to tell people, I know what you're going through if I haven't been through it. Mm -hmm. And so now it's given me the ability to be able to minister to, to pastors because yeah. I know what it's like to pioneer. And you know the hardships that they go through. Exactly. So I, it's given me that on my resume. Yeah. But I knew that God called me to become, become an evangelist. I can say multi-gifted -gift, and talented. I, I, I'm not a great singer, but I just love to sing. I love to worship the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not trying to cut a record. I'm just giving God praise. So I, 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 I sing. And then because of my testimony and my, my way of delivering it being so transparent, um, that package together, I get, for whatever reason, I like this, this church I'm going to, uh, next month, I've never been there just recently re knew, uh, met the pastor and he wants me to come out for six days. And he wants me to, he goes, I want you to do what, what I've seen you do and just, Man. just bring it the way that you bring it. And, um, because I'm unorthodox, God uses it, Yeah, you know? And, um, so I've been evangelizing and I'm not, I'm not, um, uh, I don't, I don't just box myself into one fellowship. I've fortunately God's opened up doors because I've been, because I've been around for 42 years. I've got a lot of relationships, yeah. a lot of good relationships with people. Man. And so they just, they had me come out. And like I said, not because I'm eloquent, mm -hmm. not because I'm real charismatic, yeah. but I'm just real. Well, I've had the opportunity to sit in multiple service, you know, under, you know, you being there. And I can say this, you know, and one thing about me is, you know, because of, a lot of my prison time and whatnot. And, you know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of, you know, entertainers. I heard a lot of entertainers not anointed, you know, people coming in and trying to, trying to play with your emotions in, in a sense. And th this is just my interpretation, but I really believe that when you minister and like you said, you know, I, I feel it, you know what I mean? Like you could feel when somebody's ministering under the anointing, because of course burdens are being removed yokes destroyed but it's not like you're tickling my feelings but i feel i feel god like doing either a purging a cleansing you know the holy spirit deals with all of us at different times and whatever we're going through you know it's always personal you know and um the times that you have ministered through music you know through the word you know through your altar call I've always seen God upon your ministry and, you know, I'm grateful for that, you know, and that's one of the reasons for me really. And I think I told you, my wife is the one that really like promoted, you need to get evangelist Vince on your show. You know, you need to get him <laughs> on there. And I was like, that's right. You know, like, cause like I said, and, I, and like you said in the beginning, you know, you just don't step into the church and just boom, you know, spit all of that out, you know, but I've heard glimpse glimpses and I, and I'm able, I'm good at reading between the lines, you know, cause I know like when you're ministering, you want to say, but you, you know, you kind of hold back just because, you know what I'm saying? It's, some of it's too deep, you know, for that moment, but I'd be reading through the lines and I'd be like, yeah, you know, I kind of, kind of think and the Holy Spirit's already, you know, moving and revealing things, but you are very gifted though, bro. Very gifted. And, 
you know, your music is edifying and your word. I mean, like you said, you don't come with some crazy theology and speaking in Greek and Hebrew. You come and boom, it hits. You know what I mean? Where we could relate it. You know, I would never have known that you didn't know how to read and write or any of that <laughs> stuff because you are very eloquent in your in your speech and it's seasoned with the Holy Spirit, you know, and that's you know, what probably throws people, you know, that curveball when they hear that this brother didn't know how to read or, yeah. you know, but, you know, I'm grateful for your ministry, you know what I mean? And grateful for that. you being bold and, and obedient to the call to be so transparent because, I mean, when people see you and, you know, they see you as a man's man by the way you talk, by the way you present yourself, they would never think that you've been through what you've been through. You know what I'm saying? And there's other tough men out there per se that haven't experienced that releasing of all that bondage over years you know yeah. even even brothers that have been saved and delivered you know haven't been able you know to release that you know yeah. and i know a lot of times you know we you know us as christians we you know confess our faults and our sins and our hardships before the lord and we believe he forgives us you know but like there's so many things, you know, that we're going to take to the grave with us, you know what I mean? And we're going to live with that burden until that day, you know? But when brothers are able to hear testimonies like yours, it gives them that, that sense of power and even a sense of entitlement that, you know, I have the right to share what I've been through yep. to be set free completely from this, you know? Absolutely, man. So know, yeah. even in my, even in my Christianity, my walking with the Lord, um, I've been through, you know, I've, I've been through some hardships um, in, 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 in walking with the Lord. I've, as far as my, my health, I've had cancer three times. I've had two heart attacks. I broke all five toes on my right foot. I've got so much damage in my spine. I'm actually a documented walking miracle. I shouldn't be able to walk. Wow. Um, I've got, like, it's just, and, you know, and that's in serving the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we're not exempt. Yeah. Just, I mean, with the things that happen to us in the world, you know, yeah. that's because we're living that life. Yeah. But when I gave my life to the Lord, it wasn't, I wasn't looking for, you know, okay, now uh, I want to live the abundant life and I never, I wanted just to be a walk in the park. Yeah. I've got a wayward son, you know, he's, he's strung out on methadone for the last 14 years. He's a backslider. Um, and he's caught up in that lifestyle. And I believe that one day God will waken him up spiritually mm -hmm. and open up his eyes and he'll come back to the Lord. I'm believing the Lord for that. And, but, you know, you think, man, here, I raised my kids up in the things of God. I serve the Lord with all my heart that, you know, if you, if you think that that serving God, that you're entitled to, to have the promotions at work, that your kids are supposed to be serving the Lord, that because you tithe, that your finances are supposed to be blessed. You know, the Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. That's right. We're going to go through hardships. Yeah. And I thank God that it's not by might nor by power, but by, by God's spirit that every Amen. day. I wake up and my, my mind make up, made up, you know what, I'm going to serve the Lord today, whether I'm blessed or whether, you know, whether it's cup of soups or whether it's Outback Steakhouse, I'm blessed. <laughs> that's right. Amen. Amen. Man, that's, that's some powerful, powerful stuff. We're, uh, we're going to continue on real quick, but um, we want to open up the phone lines right now. I think we've been into it for about an hour now. So we're going to open up the phone line. Do you mind if we take some calls? No, not at all. All right, so we're going to put the phone number up on, on the screen right here. Got that? We're going to put the number up. You'll see it on the bottom right there. Uh, feel free to call in. Let me make sure this is turned on. And um, we're open to conversations. I know it's been pretty deep, and some of you are like, wow, way out, and blown away by it. But you know what? It's, that's the power of the Lord, you know, speaking to you right now. So don't don't hesitate to give us a call in at 626-367-9275. Give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, man, brother Vince, I I am very encouraged, you know. And um I pray that you know, I pray that everybody was touched, man, but you know, I pray that them brothers and sisters that been hurting on to a lot of hurts and stuff that one way or another, they would get some, some help. You know what I mean? Like whether within the church, if their churches provide counseling or going to, you know, mental health and just seeking some counseling, you know, to, to release that stuff, you know, 
because it it is it's ugly living with that stuff man and like you said we go to everything else in this world to numb us you know even the church you know even people that you know go to church man they still haven't learned to to let go of that stuff you know because they haven't been able to find anybody to openly share it with right for that freeing so they live with it still trying to be christian but still holding on to that burden you know yeah it's 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 a heavy weight you know yeah i don't believe that god wants us to come to church and become anesthetized by an hour of preaching but god wants us to know that you know what if we'll bring our burdens before him because he's the burden bearer that's right amen and, and, he, and he provides those avenues to be able to get healing and to get that stuff released out of your system. I thank God that I'm blessed with a powerful, my, my, my wife, she, she's not a platform person, but she's got a powerful prayer gift of she, when she, and she like, she can't call people out from the, from the church and, and speak a word over them. But I've just, in the short time I've watched her where she prophetically prays for people. It's like, she's reading their mail mm -hmm. and God speaks through her to be able to minister into people's mm -hmm. lives. And she's done that to me on multiple occasions where she starts telling me, you know, I believe this is why you act this way. And this is what God wants to do to help you through this. Mm -hmm. and you got to learn to just trust God. And and, 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 and and it's opened my eyes to a lot of different things that I've never really understood why I do what I do and why I act the way that I act. And, uh, and it's, I, I'm, I'm very blessed and very fortunate to be able to have some of that in my life, to be able to understand me because most people, I, I just tick them off and they want to walk away from me because they can't understand what I'm going through, what I'm feeling. But, uh, you know, I, I just thank God, you know, for yeah. for that, that, that she's, that she's giving me that, that kind of unconditional love where, you know, yeah. she goes, I have patience for you because yeah. I know that you're just, <laughs> you're trying to, you're trying to work through your madness yeah. and you're traumatized yeah. and God's helping you. I'm giggling, not out of disrespect. Cause I, 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 I see my wife in, in that moment. Cause that's my wife. My, and you know, as a man, sometimes it's like, I don't want to hear that, but she's she's the one that's closest to my heart that could tell me that and to pull that out of me you know what i mean i mean like i said in the very beginning she's my biggest critic i don't think i was live yet but she's like she be <laughs> on me you know what i'm saying and, and she's not shy you know what i mean to to have that pillow talk with me sometimes where she's like look at me i'm telling you this is what the lord's telling me you know about your business about your ministry about what direction to go and you know you need to get away from that and you need to gravitate towards this and you need to let go of that and as a man it's like man i'm in control of this you know like who are you to tell me you know but hey god speaks to her and sometimes because god is speaking to her to me that's what i'd be like man lord why can't you just tell me this lord you know what I mean? why do you, yeah why do you got to run it for her because now she got that like over me didn't i tell you to do it this way didn't i tell you you know but i mean i'm so i mean we just celebrated 33 years Thank together you, you know what i'm saying it's crazy mm -hmm. Hold on, let's take this call real quick. What's up, my brother? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. What's hey, up, brother me, Louis? Google? Yeah, you're on, brother. You're on live right now. What's going on? Yeah, bro, no, I just wanted to first call in and uh, say, man, I've been watching this uh, interview. And, uh, wow, I mean, Evangelist Margolis, man really shared uh your story and i commend you for that first and foremost uh, but jojo i wanted to thank trap families you and your family for supporting us uh i told you we hit the the streets yesterday to um outreach that backpack giveaway and it was a success so again keep doing what you're doing thank you for the support and uh i remember evangelist margolis looked at me Praying for me, and he said the devil should have killed you when he had a chance. Uh, I'll never forget that. Uh, I, I think about that all the time when we're out in the streets, uh, ministering to the homeless, ministering to people who have been hurt, going into the motels uh, to find these kids. And, and uh, I just thank God that the power that God has given us allows us to speak the way uh, Brother Brother Vince spoke today not ashamed to give God glory. So again, thank you. Thank you, Trap Families, for all you do. And Brother Jojo, keep going. I like the shirt you got on. <laughs> yeah, I know you do, brother. <laughs> <laughs> all right, brother, you be blessed. All right, brother. God bless you, brother. All right, Thanks, brother. For God bless. Thanks for calling right. in. Bye. Bye. Yeah, that's a brother, man. He been through some 
COVID almost took him out, man. I mean, they were talking about doing lung transplants and this and that. And, man, that lying devil tried to rob him. And, you know, he, he actually opened up our first podcast and he shared, you know, a story of his son being brought up in the church and, um, you know, ended up going to the Marine Corps and ended up, you know, separating from God at some point and ended up getting busted for, for a very, a very heinous crime and, and was fighting the death penalty and everything. And, you know, he talks about his first ministry being to his, you know, like knowing his son, you know, what he's going through and stuff. And yeah, he was going through it though. He was going through it and he shared, how the Lord had given him strength, you know, to stand by his son's side, you know, um, through it all, you know, and just the way the devil had tried to take him. And for you to tell him at some point, I don't know what point in his life was it that you spoke that to him, that the devil should have took him out when he had an opportunity. Because this brother, I mean, yeah, he'd been through a lot, but you know what, now he's like selfless. And what I mean by that is he's out there feeding the homeless. He goes into the encampments with his team and goes, I mean, he's, I mean, he does a lot, you know what I mean? And puts himself in high risk situations a lot, you know? But um, yeah, man. So praise God for Brother Louie, man. And what, what what church does he attend? Uh Baldwin Park Praise Chapel. Okay. I remember yeah. him now, yes. Yeah, under Pastor yeah. Raymond. Yeah, yeah. He's been there for quite some time. And yeah, but yeah, man, that's you see how the Lord uses you, you know. You never just, know, man. Never, you know, yeah. it's just something that probably got him to go that much further because, you know, he's battled, he's battled a lot, you know what I mean? And he shared that in his, in his testimony in our episode. So I'm not saying he, he ain't said nothing that he, that he ain't said already, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. he talked about going to church high and stuff. And, you know, and this was while being a leader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, Lou, like, hold up, let's mute that real quick. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, but you know what, God, like you said earlier, you know, God chooses the foolish things of this world, man. And, you know, it's a process. And thank God that, you know, he hasn't given up on us. You know, he's a long suffering God. And thank God that he doesn't give up on us because, yes, man, everyone else will give up on us. But, man, thank God that he he remains faithful, you know, yep. he cannot he, deny himself. Yeah. Even in, in the worst times, you know, God still finds a way of showing up, you know. And I, you know, I thank you for sharing too. And I pray that my audience caught it when you were talking about when you first got saved and your conversations were with God were straight from the heart, asking questions. Because a lot of times as Christians, you know, we have this mentality, like, don't ask God questions, just do, just do, you know? And I, I don't know if it's because I got saved in prison and I didn't really have a pastor, like really discipling me. I had a chaplain that would come in and out, you know what I mean? But never really like took me under the wing type of thing. So I had to just read my Bible and figure it out as I went, you know, but I, I've always asked God questions because I've always felt like God was approachable like that. I didn't think God was, um, was, um, you know, like stressed out with my questionings, you know what I mean? Like, Oh my goodness. Why are you asking this dumb question? You know what I mean? Like you see some fathers, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, why, why are you asking that dumb question? You know, I, I I've never seen God in that light. I've always, when I, when I finally came to the cross, I seen God as all knowing I'm all that. Caller. And, um, let's take this real quick. Let's see. This is Jojo with Trap No More. How can I help you? Let's see if I can get a connection. Hello. Hello. Yo, what's up, Jojo? It's what's Tommy. Tommy, Tommy who? Tommy Gunn. Hey, what's up, Tommy Mario. Gunn? What's hey, up, man, I'm about to walk up this mountain, look at the super moon. I'm here in Bakersfield, man. Winning souls for Jesus. Tell the brother real quick, because I'm probably going to lose contact. I got to look at that. He, so, could, he, could, he, he could hear you, Tommy. Where you're live, I'm, I'm living on a farm now. I'm living on a farm now, man. Got my family, man. And uh, the Lord is good, bro. He is so good. And and uh, Tom, I, 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 I too um, have a similar testimony. I, I couldn't read, so I could say, and, and that was a good reminder. Good reminder and uh, uh, shalom, you guys uh, have peace. And uh, thank you. It, it just ministered a lot to me. I was driving with my wife, and, and she too, I call her the little Holy Spirit. And she's always telling me, I told you so. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh, I hit myself in the head. But love you, brother, man. I, I'm praying for you guys. Keep us in prayer. And uh, we're uh, walking up this uh, hill. 
uh, to go look at the super moon because it's super dark over at where I'm at. All right, Tommy. It's good to hear from you, brother, man. You stay safe out on them roads. He's a truck driver. All right. And he travels with his wife. Yeah. That's awesome. And they homeschool your son. You homeschool your son from the truck, right? Yeah. Your, your wife? And we have my daughter. And but yeah, we're not. Daughter. We're, yeah, we're... His little daughter. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. We're not dri- I'm driving trucks still locally. I'm here in Bakersfield. I live with a I live with a messianic pastor. Oh, so okay. I'm learning Hebrew right now. So I'm like, whoa, my mind's so blown right now. Okay. Like we want to know the truth. We got to go to the OGs, right? We always All say, right. we're an OG. Got to go OG. <laughs> so uh, the, the you know, the rural Rakadesh is just really moving in my life right now. And But brother, you've been a blessing in my life. And anyone from Praise Chapel, I love Pastor Raymond. Uh, uh, hearing uh, uh, Pastor Mike's story, I've heard so much about him. And I even had the opportunity to go to his um, his funeral with my uncle, uh, Pastor Johnny Kingsbury. And um, even watching my brother Mario, you know, you did tell me my brother, Watching my brother in Bakersfield casting demons out of people through 20 years of praying from me. My mom got saved and my brothers got saved. And the Lord is faithful. You know, Amen. the Lord is faithful. And so Tom, Tommy, let me uh, let me let me say, say something. Things. Let me tell you something before you hang up, man. I always share you. Let me tell you something, Brother Vince, about this young man. When I came in a bomb park, he was he was probably still a young teenager. Tommy, how old were you in 2003? About what? About I was in my tw- 20s. Oh, early 20s? 20s? Early yes, 20s. I was in my early twenties. Early twenties. This guy right here, you talk about evangelist spirit, brother. This brother would bring people to the church every week. They weren't the type of people that most church members would want in the front row because um oh man, we got brother Dave on the phone. But uh hey, let me take this call real quick, Tommy. But God yeah, bless you, man, brother. and we'll talk, yes. okay? All yes, right, brother. Absolutely. All right, God bless. Shalom, brother. All okay. right, bye bye. Bye. Hey, brother David. Brother Dave. What's up, brother? Hey, What's I up, hear brother? you, brother. I hear you. I hear. You. Hey, Dave. Hold on, real quick, so I don't lose this train of thought. Real quick, all right? Just real quick. All right, brother. And you could hear this too. So this young brother that just called in right now, when when I got to the church, right? He used to bring in like drug addicts, drug drug addicts, prostitutions, gang members all kinds of people right and they would come in man and i was a usher at the time and i remember bro i remember like it was yesterday when it was offering time tell me that these people wouldn't throw in like bus tokens one of them tried to put in a can of like i think menudo or chili beans or something (laughs) and i was so blessed that they just wanted to give what they had yeah it reminded me of the lady with the two mics you know what i'm saying yeah and I used to get so mad, bro. And I don't mean to speak bad on any any church people or anything like that, but I'd get mad when I would hear over the intercom, over the speaker, hey, put them in the back, make sure they don't go up towards the front. You know what I mean? Like, I would get upset, bro. You know what I mean? It really, like, hurt my feelings. You know what I'm saying? Sure, like, absolutely. Like, we should literally, like, usher them up there. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Where they would be focused and not be distracted or anything. Kind of like what you said earlier when you first got saved. Yep. You were up in the front row to avoid the distractions, right? Sure. But anyways, that young man right there, that was his ministry. And he would, man, he would bring, I'm telling you, he would bring them in. That's awesome. He had a heart, That's a heart for, 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 yeah. the, for the streets, and man, bless Tommy. But anyways, Dave, thank you for calling in, brother. We were just talking about you, right? I mean, your ears must have been itching before we started the podcast because Brother Vince mentioned you. Oh, really? Yeah. Brother Vince, man. Hey, dude, let's let's get Brother Vince right now to sing a little Carmen, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to sing it back. Right? <laughs> Come on, Vince. Yeah, yeah, some good yeah, ones. Come for it, man. Yeah. That's cool, man. It's good you had him on. What's going on, time. David? Not much, brother. Not much. I uh, just right here. I, I was uh, I was uh, studying a little bit some stuff that for work, and then uh, I went. I saw. I went on Instagram real quick. They're like, "Oh, there's bits." So that's how I see you right now. How's there, how's everything? Everything's everything, bro. Everything's good. I'm blessed. Good, good, man. Hey, hey. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you laugh right now. So I, I seen you a couple months ago at Disneyland. You seen me? And, uh, you're, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. I seen you at Disneyland, and you're walking by. Okay, bro. This is the thing, bro. You can't wear the hard shoes at Disneyland, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm and I'm was I counting blue, was 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 blue down? I, I think there was like some Stacy Adams, bro. And you had your 
you had your 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 uh your i think they were jeans creased down you had the button up shirt i said vince this is i see you from far because i was in the i was in the line with melissa <laughs> i see you passing by i think with your wife and then i see you passing by and i said i go there goes vince margolis and I was like, he's dressed like he's he has a, a three day revival this week. <laughs> when you when you go to Disneyland, man, you gotta you gotta get the it's you gotta get the, the tennis shoes, bro, and just wear like a t shirt, bro. You don't gotta be like the three day revival, bro. You know what I mean? I know they need jeans. Know. From, jo- Jojo's, on got, <laughs> Jojo's got a t shirt, and I'm wearing a shirt and tie. What's up with that? Huh? <laughs> and he got his Stacy's on. Got my Stacy's on. Well, he knew he was coming Stacey's. to a church. <laughs> he's ready. He's ready. No, nah, it's all good, man. No Vince my whole life, man. So it's good to see him on there, man. Yeah. I'm glad I'm glad he's there and I'm glad uh glad I got to meet Jojo and uh we, we we're friends now. So uh yeah. I was telling guys, him uh, I was telling him, Dave, that when I went on your podcast, man, that I felt right at home from the very beginning. Uh didn't I tell you, Vince? Yep, sure I said did. we started yeah. talking about it and exchanging names. I said, Man, we were all in the same circles at the same time. Just you know, what I mean, we're just we just didn't cross you know paths like that. But I told him too that yeah, I, was, I was so blessed to, to meet world. you and thank you. I I appreciate that. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, on. man, it's it's it, it was really good, man. It was really good. I mean, it's yeah. a it's definitely a small church world, man, and yeah. uh, it's good to have the connections over the years. W- one thing I, I think Vince will will uh, agree with me on this is. Uh, it's funny, man. You you go to church. You you meet all kinds of characters in church, man. And uh, <laughs> you meet just a, a wide range of of people. And I was thinking about that the other day. I said, man, if I ever do stand up Christian stand up comedy, I was like, man, I'm just gonna talk about all the people we 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 meet in church, man. Just <laughs> different, all kinds of lifestyle, just fun people, strange people, just just a mix of people. But uh it's good over the years to have like good friends and, and good relationship and good connections, man. And, uh, yeah. You know, you never, you never know, you know, you, you meet people and you know, they're in the same realms. You just, you just never met them. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Hey, and real quick, Dave, um, for all you watching, be sure to check out street gospel podcast. Um, you can find it on YouTube, Instagram, find them on TikTok. Um, I don't know about Facebook. I, I don't think I connected with you on Facebook, Dave. Do you have a Facebook page as well? I, I have just a personal Facebook page. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no street gospel. So yeah. street gospel all over YouTube and then any platform. Yeah, then, be course, sure Instagram. to be sure to check them out, man. Some very powerful testimonies, man. I mean, down to earth conversation. So be sure to check them out. Go like and subscribe and um, give some support, brothers. Thank you, hey, Dave, man, for man. calling in, hey, man. Hey, hey, Jojo, yeah. one quick thing. I, I had another guy the other day from from uh, from San Gabriel Valley from La Puente on the show. I didn't even know he was from La Puente SGV, but he came on the show and he goes, "Oh yeah, I grew up in uh, La Puente." I said, Man, "This is the La Puente <laughs> show now." It's like everybody I had. I had five guests that were from La Puente. I said, "Man, I'm, hey, I'm just well, going well, to change the La Puente." Hey, podcast. remember what I told you though? There's a lot of different sides, so hey, you know it's I know, all good. I know, I got yeah. you, bro. Papa told me that too. <laughs> so I learned about Bassett and all that stuff real quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. All good, brother. All right, man. You guys have a good night, man. Bless you. All right, I'll Dave. God bless you. Good talking, all right. Dave. All right, brother. Yeah, that was a that was that was one of my favorite podcasts to be on because it was just it, it felt so at ease, you know. Because yeah. I've been on some some straight worldly podcasts, but all glory to God that they allowed me to speak to their um platform their community which they need jesus you know what i mean and that's sure. who god's called me to you know i don't know that one thing I'm about me calling. is they're coming thank you for calling in hello yeah, hello yeah you reach trap no more podcast what's up jojo this what? is johnny Concurs. who i'm sorry i didn't hear hear the name Johnny Harris. Oh, Chef with Chino Valley with oh. Pastor Ruben. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's up? What's up, brother? What's up, my brother? I, I see you have my uh, good friend, uh, Pastor uh, Vince. Oh, yeah, yeah. Good buddy of mine. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, I just want to, uh, I know you can hear me, but I just want to tell him thank you because uh, I'm a young evangelist and uh, he told me how to, uh, 
because I actually got, got to open doors a couple of years back, and uh, he just said, just be patient, and make the connections, and watch the Lord will be opening doors for you. And he has. You know, I just want to tell him thank you. You're, you're, for you're speaking so welcome, Brother Johnny, life. man. You, I, 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 I watch you every now and then, and, and, uh, and I see how the guys are starting to have you come out. Be, you got to just remember, man, God will always make room for your gift, bro. He will always make room yes, for you. You just stay faithful in the little, and he will make you, man, he'll give you so much opportunities. And, uh, and just walk the walk that you talk, bro. Amen. Yes, yes, amen. Yes, yes. I just went with, I was with uh, uh, PC Las Vegas uh, months ago. And uh, and uh, so that was been good. And then they're going to have you a couple of months, next month. Yeah, I'm and, coming up to the minister gonna, for the conference, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, we're gonna me and my wife going to Poland uh, next month with Pastor Ruben and the team. Praise the Lord. So I just want to thank you, Pastor Vince, for speaking into my life, uh, mentoring my life as a young evangelist, and uh, I just want to just call in to thank you guys. Oh, thank Amen. you. I appreciate that, Praise Brother John. God. Favor on you, uh, evangelist Johnny. Man, you keep up the good work, brother. Yes. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. One of Pastor Ruben's disciples right yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I see him doing his thing too, man. Praise yeah. God. And it's like you said, you know, as long as you stay willing, stay faithful, man, God's going to, you know, send you where you never thought you would go, you know? That's for sure, man. Yeah. That's for sure. I always say, man, you know, God uses me. God uses me. And um, God uses me because. Earlier we were talking about, you said it, I forgot the exact phrase, but you said you want to be able to minister in your healing and not in your burden. But how did that go? Is that I, I, I'm, I keep asking God, I, I'm, I'm, I want to get, from, uh, get to a place that I'm not ministering from my pain and then I can start ministering from my healing. Yeah, yeah. And when you said that, I was thinking, I was thinking about, I said, I don't know if I'll ever truly be delivered from that because I surround myself with the pains that I've been through. I'm always around gang members. I'm always around drug addicts. I'm still doing prison ministry through prison fellowship. And it's like, it, it constantly triggers where I come from because I'm still ministering to the same old me, the old me mm -hmm. that's, that I'm trying to get them to where I'm at today, you know? And I, and I think that that's why, and I, and I, like I said earlier, I learned to live with, with them pains. You, if you don't mind me saying it like that, or with them scars, uh, you know, with the trauma that I've been through, you know what I mean? And, um, it doesn't lead me to depression. It doesn't lead me to, you know, anything else, you know what I'm saying? But I have them moments where it kicks in, you know, mm -hmm. at, at any given time, sometimes it kicks in, you know? And, um, I said, that's because I'm, I'm, I'm there still trying to bring people out of that how. So it's a constant reminder of, sure. of what I've lived through and what I've been through. But in that though, I know how real it is to deal with these people, how compassionate I need to be, how, you know, long suffering I need to be. Cause as you know, one of the things in dealing with people, there's a lot of backstabbing. There's a lot of, you know, you think you do so much props and then it's like they slap you in the face by going back and doing what they've done and, you know, or yet alone turn around and start um, trying to smut you up some way, somehow, you know, and it's like, why am I dealing with this for when I could just enjoy my kids, enjoy my wife, enjoy my business and travel the world. But no, I still find myself right there. Yeah. I know what you exactly mean. I was ministering at a, at a, a church and um, one of the sisters made a very derogative statement to another sister. And then she ended up at another service that I was ministering out in Santa Paula. Mm -hmm. And she had told, told the sister, I don't believe his testimony. I think he made that up. Mm. He's lying. And then she showed up in Santa Paula and I, the, I it was the first time I ministered there. And minute, when I preached there, the pastor asked me, because I want you to implement your testimony into your message. And so I did it. And when I did it, I didn't know that she had said that mm -hmm. until after the service was over. But she apologized to me after the service. Mm -hmm. She goes, nobody could have made that up. She goes, I apologize for making that statement. Yeah. God dealt with her. God convicted her. She was, in, she was in tears because the Holy Spirit 
showed her that you know that that you know for, for her to make that kind of a statement was was uncalled for. Yeah. I mean, it was. I'm, I'm sure she made it out of her own pain. She made that because for she probably could relate to what I was saying. Yeah. And for a man, to, it, it's common for a woman to say that she's been abused or mm-hmm. been been molested or been raped or whatever. Mm-hmm. But for a man to get up and so transparently say that, it was hard for her to wrap her mind around yeah. that I could be so transparent about it. So to her, it, it seemed like it was something that I yeah. made up. Mm-hmm. And but the Holy Spirit dealt with her and convicted her. Amen. And really just ministered to her in a way where she even brought her to the place where she apologized for making that statement to that other sister to me. Yeah. You know, but uh, it happens, you know, it's part of ministry. Yeah. And it's it's part of the cross that we have to carry. People are going to make make comments and they're going to you could you could invest your life and pour your heart out to people and and you know, they'll wrongly accuse you. And and and, you know, it's just it. It just comes with it. Man. Yeah. And we got to just keep our eyes on the cross, man. That's keep it. On Jesus. That part right there. Well, Vince, we've been into it now a little bit over an hour, about maybe an hour and 10 minutes or whatnot. But I do want to thank you, though, for being patient in the beginning. Sorry for the Wi-Fi mix-up. You know, you was, was getting ready. You was getting ready to hit a trigger in me right there. Ooh, man. I was going to go over there and pull Rob out of his seat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know I'm what? You, you know what? I, I'm going to blame you, though, because you said, you know what? With me all this week, if if it goes bad, it's all on me because because yes. the devil's been trying to tear me up. So I was like, okay, yeah, this is Vince's. This is Vince's doing. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the devil doesn't rob an empty house, bro. Those are goods inside there. He's trying to stop it from happening. <laughs> That's right. But yeah. I I believe our our viewers were blessed by your testimony, by your transparency, by you know the hope that you give because I'm sure that there's plenty of people in some form or fashion that have been abused in some sort of way that have been left by their loved ones forsaken, you know, called the worst of worst, you know, um, probably told, you know, I, I, I know I have one viewer um, and I won't, you know, say his or her name, but she talked about how her mom had always called her a loser her whole life, wish she would have aborted her. And, you know, she's been nothing but a, a pain, you know, in her life and stuff. And this girl talked about killing herself and stuff. And, you know, she gave her life to the Lord eventually. But, you know, there's a lot of viewers that have probably at some point suffered that pain, that rejection. And to hear your testimony, how you were able to, you know, come to the cross and be set free and delivered and set on a, on a, on a victorious path. And like you said, it's not easy, you know, turning Christian don't mean everything, you know, gets better, no. you know, I, I hate when By no means. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes I want to interrupt that altar call when they were like, if you want your marriage to, you know, be better, you know, give your life to the Lord right now. You want your kids not to, you know, rebel, come and give your, and I'm like, man, you better let them know that that's not a hundred percent guarantee. You know what I mean? Cause that wife probably ain't met for him that his kids are probably going to have to go through some hellfire before they have their moment of salvation. You know, you better let these people, you know, but it is what it is. It's definitely a personal relationship. That's exactly. For sure. But I've come to realize as children of God, we all got the same birthmark. We have a target on our back. Amen. And the devil's mad. Amen. And, and, you know, and so, um, like the Bible says, it's not to the swift or to the mighty, but to him that endured to the end. That's and, right. Uh, I'm, I've got my mind made up. I've, you know, like I said, I've been walking with the Lord for 42 years Amen. and I've had my mountaintop experiences and I've had my valley experiences. I've let go of the hand of hope, but the hand of hope never let go of me. Amen. And, um, I, I'm not faithful. He is. Amen. God's faithful. Amen. Um, I'm just two breaths away from muffin. It, bro. You, 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 you say something to me. You, if you slap me, I just, no, I'm not might. I'll, I'll slap you back. <laughs> That's just who I am. Amen. I, I always kid around and say I'm I'm 99.9% saved. I'm <laughs> half holy, half hood. <laughs> Don't play with me, pray for me. <laughs> That's funny. Praise God. Well, brother Vince, listen, before we officially log off of this um this live feed, if you don't mind what I what I like to do in the last, you know, few minutes, if you don't mind, just looking into this camera on your right side. That one's totally focused in on you. And if you don't mind just closing it out with just one last powerhouse statement to that person that's thinking of giving up, that person that has no hope in their situation, 
if sure. you could just you know that shotgun message just really quick you got it bro close it out but you know if if, if you're watching i want you to know it's not coincidental if it wasn't something that you thought man i think i'll just drop in you may think that but it was a setup from god because god he's in control he's a sovereign god and nothing happens by chance nothing happens by mistake it's not a fluke and god wants you to know so much that he loves you and that he has a plan for your life you're not a mistake i wasn't a planned pregnancy i was a mistake in my parents eyes but god knew i was coming my parents were just two two dogs in heat at a motel six and but god knew that i was coming and for you that might be listening and think that maybe you don't understand why you're here and you don't understand why the hell you're going through you know god loves you it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or who you are or who you think you are god loves you and he can reach he, he he's not mad at you he's mad about you and he wants to come into your life and the bible says that he would have it that no one would perish he doesn't want it he doesn't want anybody to go to hell it's a choice that we make we're free will people we're not puppets we make the choices and i thank god that 42 years ago jesus came and knocked on the door of my heart that i responded i just said you know what lord if you're real because i like i said you heard it in my testimony tonight i didn't know the love of a father i didn't they couldn't understand i couldn't fathom that god could love me after all the hell that i've been through but he wants he wants you to know Larry that he loves you he loves you so much and he doesn't want you to perish and if you think you're going through hell right now it's nothing compared to the hell you'll end up in because the bible says that unless a man be born again that he cannot see the kingdom of god and when i say born again i'm talking about just asking god to come and live inside of you it's not about a relationship it, 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 at, at a church it's not about signing your name on a membership it's not about shaking a pastor's hand it's about opening up your heart and inviting christ to come into your heart and be the 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 the, the savior of your soul but the lord of your life and I want you to know that it's the greatest, greatest decision you ever make. It, it, does it stop you from going through things? No, it doesn't exempt you. You're still going to go through things. But I thank God that I have a father that holds my hand when I walk through the valleys. He's there to embrace me when I'm feeling lonely. He's there to assure me when I'm feeling scared. He's there to let, let me know that he'll stand by me and he'll never walk out on me. He'll never reject me. He'll never abandon me. And that's he wants you to know that tonight, that if you've never, ever received Christ, or maybe you have and you walked away, I've been there. I've walked away from the hand of hope. But I want you to know that he will, he has such a relentless love for you, a reckless love for you, that he will leave the 99 to come and rescue you for wherever you might be at. He doesn't want you to stay in that place. He wants you to come to yourself. You see the, the story of the prodigal son when he was in the, in the hog pen? He, he didn't get an email. He, he, he didn't have some person come by and, and, and encourage him. No, it was an inside job. He came to himself in his mind. He came to himself, man. He said to himself that the servants in my father's house have more than enough to eat. And here I perish. You got to come to yourself and understand that God loves you and his arms are open wide and he's waiting for you to come back home. Yeah, you, you, you got lied. You got ripped off. The devil pulled the carpet out from underneath you. But today, not tomorrow, not next week, but today, if you will come to him today in repentance, I believe that Jesus is coming back real soon. And he's waiting for he's waiting for the world to repent. He's waiting for the church to repent and come back to the saving, the saving relationship that Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross for. And so if you're out there today and, and you're you don't know Jesus or or you're backslidden, it's just a breath away. All you got to do is say a simple prayer. All you got to do is just just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins because I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And today I ask you to forgive me and to come into my heart and be my Lord and be my savior and wash me of all my sins and write my name down in the book of life. And from this day forward, I'll serve you. I'll live for you. I'll tell others about you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to empower me, to help me to walk this walk of faith. And I receive that today in Jesus name. And if you say that prayer, simple prayer of faith, you say that by faith, believing and trusting God, the Bible says, you shall be saved. And I want you to know it's just been a blessing. It's been an honor to be with you guys tonight, to be able to share my story. You know, people that tell me all the time, Vince, you need to write a book. The book's already been written. It's called The Bible. You look in the stories of the Bible, men that have gone through things that you it, we can't even fathom. The, the, you know, we, we think that here in the Western world that we go through persecution, we can't even imagine what persecution is. If you read the Bible, you'll see what persecution is. I've never been put in a lion's den. I've never been thrown into a, an oven. I, you know, I've never been, you know, tarred and feathered. 
I've never been put on the beach in high tide, strapped in a, in a bag and, and, and truly, that's persecution. But we here, we live in a world where we get free choices. And today, the best choice that you can make is in your heart today. Today, give your heart to Jesus Christ today. And I want you to know it's the best decision you'll ever make. God bless you. Appreciate the time that you've given us tonight. We'll be with you guys. Thank you, Brother Jojo. Amen. Amen. That was a powerful prayer, powerful message. And uh, I just want to thank all of you uh, for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe the YouTube channel. Please, um, you know, share it. And if you would like to listen to it while you're working out, driving or anything like that, tomorrow morning, you actually will be later on tonight. You will be able to listen to it on your um, iPhone devices, on your Kindle. If you have Amazon, uh, Spotify, it's also on, um, what's that other one? The, oh my goodness. Uh, I forgot the name of them, but any of the podcast forms, uh, audibles, you'll be able to find it on there. So you could like work out to it, clean your house, drive to it, whatnot, share it with somebody. And uh, I appreciate all your support. I pray you have a good week. Don't forget to check out my website at www.trapfamilies.com. Uh, if you know anybody that's, um, you know, can kind of relate to this platform, you know, whether they're a mother, a father, a daughter, a grandmother, grandfather, a child incarcerated, or they got a loved one that's, you know, trapped in addiction and would like to share their story, be sure to hit me up on my thing, on my website. There is a discovery call, okay?